uh, Hillary has been lengthening her excuses as to why uh, she lost the election. She didn't really lose the election. It was stolen from her uh, by, I think it's up to 24 different excuses she has now. Number 24 is content farms in Macedonia. And uh, as I said, uh, my grandfather was a uh, Macedonian content farmer. And uh, we often think about, you know, gathering on the porch and recalling the old days on the Macedonian. I never thought, he never thought that the old content farmers he left behind in Macedonia would one day steal the U.S. presidential election. They are gnarled, hardworking Macedonian peasants. And the way they were able to reach out and uh, steal the election from a well-oiled machine headed by John Podesta is, uh, is impressive. Oh, okay. Well, we need, to, we need to have a proper introduction. My name is Jason Miko, and I am in the, uh, the beautiful town of Oro Valley, Arizona, uh, which is a small town just north of Tucson, Arizona. And I'm recording this with my friend... Uh, Tritin Shilimanov, uh, calling in from the horrible, dreary... Uh, smog-covered city of Skopje, Macedonia, soon to be North Macedonia if uh, the plans of our overlords uh, come to fruition. And uh, it's practically night here. We have a solid time difference between Arizona and Skopje. And it's really... Eight hours? Yep. No, more? Eight? No, eight hours right now. Oh, yeah. Okay. We, uh... See, in Arizona, we, uh, we, don't, we don't do daylight savings time, as we like to say, we're on God's time all the time. <laughs> yeah, well, the thing, you know, the thing about daylight savings time, and this is a digression from our main uh, subject today, of course, is that in Arizona, uh, it's so bloody hot in the summer that the last thing you want is another hour of daylight. <laughs> at the end of the day. So, so that, uh, that would explain why we've never gone on daylight savings time. But, um, no, but it's not I understand a... why, uh, why other people places might want to have it, but that's not our subject today. I think, I think today we want to talk about something topical, and, and I'll tell you, Svetin, um, it seems that our friends in the government in Macedonia, the media, the, the ac academia, the think tanks, civil society, are, are just absolutely obsessed with the Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban, and mm. uh, the former Prime Minister of Macedonia, Nikola Gorevsky. It seems like both men are living rent-free in their heads. What do you think? Absolutely. I mean, this is all they report on. We have... Uh, pro-government TV stations here, uh, when they have the news, it's like uh, 40 minutes of news, 25, 30 of them dedicated to Gruevski and Orban, even though there is literally no news since he was, uh, his uh, asylum was approved and basically he is now, uh, you know, this chapter is, is finished uh, news-wise, but uh, what else are they going to talk about? I mean, I was joking with somebody that they could devote a lot of their airtime on uh, all the new factories opening up in Macedonia, which is what Grevsky was doing when he was in charge. You know, you have to fill in uh, the news and um, he would just, uh, you know, the government PR machine would just crank up stories about all the, all the new factories which are coming from Germany, from the United States, opening up uh, car parts plants here. But this is not happening anymore. So... The, the main news item of the past 10 years is no longer, uh, they cannot use it anymore. And what else is happening? Nothing much. Well, that's, no, you, you, sorry, you bring up a good point. I want to emphasize, I think, uh, is that because the, the government is, is talking about this nonstop and her friends in the media and civil society, etc., because they want to distract, it's a distraction for them from the issue of changing Macedonia's name, identity, constitution, language, heritage, history, culture, and everything else. Uh, and the fact that you mentioned that they are just not doing anything on the economy, on the rule of law, on pollution, and a whole host of things. It's much easier to to point over there and say, look at these shiny objects uh, mm. to distract attention. Look, and I think you're absolutely right. It's, that's, that's the whole reason. Yeah, I mean, uh, they're actually doing a lot of stuff in the field of economy and the rule of law, but it's not something you could uh, brag about. Basically, in the field of economy, they're... Increasing taxes left and right, uh, <laughs> and it's showing. It's really showing uh, uh, with uh, companies which were actually supporting this leftist government in the past now panically, saying that they cannot stand this. They're, they're increasing uh, taxes on bank deposits, which is always a weak point in the Balkans. We've suffered cascading collapses of banks <clears throat> short 25 years ago. So. That's, again, something which uh, you don't want to do. You want to encourage people to save money in uh, 
uh, especially you know in your local currency and in the field of rule of law i mean they're really this is literally what we used to read about in the old communist times the way they would manage uh, the courts and use them against political opponents with uh, uh, made up charges uh, you know you show me the man and i'll find the crime in him <laughs> you know it's literally being right. applied here well and and on the economy i think it's worth which worth remembering re worth pointing out that this government was elected uh, even though they did not receive the majority of votes uh, mm. the government was installed i should say they on a promise of redistribution of wealth which mm. is a fancy way of saying we're going to take from uh, we're going to raise your taxes and take from uh, from those who have more and give to those who have less. And 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 it's always fun because they they say it's. I know the prime minister and the finance minister recently have said that you're going to a progressive tax system because mm. the current one isn't fair. Yeah. But they alone are wise enough to decide what is fair for uh, Macedonian taxpayers, which is entirely subjective. There are no economic arguments. No, we're we're coming back to what. Uh... Barack Obama said way back when he was asked, even if you have evidence that the flat tax brings more uh, revenue to the state budget and generates more economic uh, growth, because obviously people have more money to invest and uh, spend, uh, would you still support progressive taxation? And he said yes, because it's fair. And uh, in our case, it's not even hypothetical. After uh, Griff right. introduced flat tax in 2006, we actually saw more economic growth, but at the same time, we saw a lot more uh, uh, money pouring into the coffers of the state budget because uh, people who would simply avoid paying their income tax in the past were now reporting all their uh, in income uh, to the last, you know, to the you know, actual accurate extent of their earnings because it's really not worth their while to hide any of the of the income to do creative uh, bookkeeping they would normally do when taxes are high because taxes were so low and flat. Now you're introducing well, all, yeah. Yeah, no, I got a, got a real life example. And I remember in 2008 or nine, I can't remember what it was, but I was renting an apartment there. Mm -hmm. And uh, before the flat tax, the guy uh, had said, you know, pay me in cash because he didn't want to uh, didn't want to report um, sure. you know, the taxes. And after that, he said, go ahead and, and wire it to me. I'm happy to pay the tax, etc." Uh, fortunately, I can't remember who that was, so the authorities can't go after him now. I'm sure they would if they uh, had his name. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely, as you're pointing out, a real-life example of, of how the flat tax uh, can actually increase uh, the, the tax revenue that the government takes in. Yeah, it's the Boba Diners rule, because, you know, Boba Diners is uh, the husband of Radmila Shekerinska, the defense minister, and he was famously, uh, you know, he was famously renting a number of apartments which he and Shekerinska own to the Diners Club company in Skopje, which is uh, he's the manager of. And, right. and he would uh, basically rent apartments to his own company for an extremely high, uh, you know, far above the market value, it was reported. And um, they couldn't explain this. And, uh, you know, the idea was, and, you know, this is the uh this is what we all believe what happened here was that he wanted to pay himself like uh, a seller which would be fitting of a diners club branch manager like five ten thousand fifteen thousand uh euros a month which would i imagine they would pay but you have to pay the uh, the high taxes which we have for the healthcare and the retirement fund on the whole amount but it's still much easier for you to give yourself a, uh, like a modest salary, 500 euros a month, 700 euros a month, something like that. And then the, the rest of the money you want to take in, uh, in the name of salary from your own company, you can just uh, creatively rent out something to your own name, uh, something you already own, like a car or like an apartment to the company you manage. Obviously, right. you're, you're not giving the apartment or the car to the company, you're still using it or renting it out in real life to somebody else. <laughs> if you don't need the apartment uh, or you're driving your own car, but it's rented out to your company, but uh, you only pay the flat 10% 10, 10 fee on uh, rent income. While if you right. if you give yourself like 3,000 euros in salary from your own company, you have to pay, well, easily about 40% on, on that amount uh, in, in uh, healthcare and the retirement taxes. 
so yeah, we have uh, this is a well established uh, uh, you know uh, approach when wh wherever uh, you have to pay progressive taxes. Right. Well, you're listening to the Macedonian Content Farmers podcast. We'll be right back. Okay, do you have an ad? Do you have like commercial? <laughs> Welcome back to welcome back to the Macedonian Content Farmers Podcast. We've been talking about the economy and how uh, the current government of Zoran Zaev is, is trying to distract attention from the economy and from all the problems in Macedonia by focusing on uh, the Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban, and Nikola Gorevsky. And again, that's all a distraction. But Svetin, I, I saw one of the uh, news articles today because I scan the news daily uh, about what's going on in Macedonia. And especially with our friends in Greece. And I noticed uh, that uh, Katamanini mm -hmm. uh, talked about how the Greeks are now demanding, uh, per the press agreement, that Macedonian school books, history books, school uh, maps, atlases, teaching guides, etc., change. Again, press agreement. We saw two weeks ago how the foreign minister of Bulgaria handed over 30 pages of remarks on Macedonian school books uh, as it pertains to just, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, to the 6th yeah. and 7th grade. But now we have a, a case where both Greece and Bulgaria, the foreign ministries and other ministries within the two countries, are actively working to change Macedonian school books, history books, textbooks, maps, atlases, teaching guides. And effectively, it, what this is going to do is it's going to change Macedonian history and the, and the, the, uh, the, 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 the history that the children are being taught. And... That's not good for the future of Macedonia. Yeah, we kept seeing this, the, the, the treaties with Greece and Bulgaria, the way they're phrased there, they solve nothing. They actually uh, establish committees which are going to open like a million new issues. Like uh, you can imagine how many historic figures are mentioned in the history books, how many maps are used, you know, battles being named. All of this is going to be fiercely debated between the Greeks and the Bulgarians who often do not see eye to eye on these issues. So we could, we could uh, technically, it could happen that we, a Macedonian historic expert would uh, have to agree to one set of conditions when negotiating with the Bulgarian government, with a Bulgarian government appointed history expert of, on what to write in our history books. And then the Greek guy will, will demand that he writes something else. I mean, actually, you know, if, uh, the best approach here would be to have the Greeks and the Bulgarians sit down and agree between themselves first and then come to us and tell us this is what we decide that your history is going to say and is going to look like because otherwise we could be going back and forth between Athens and Sofia and Brussels endlessly debating whether Tsar Samuel was a Bulgarian or whether a, a Byzantine Empire Justinian was a Macedonian or a Greek or whatever. Yeah. It's going to be endless. Well, I think maybe perhaps we should contact uh, Michael Palin, John Cleese, and Eric Idle of Monty Python because this this does sound like the making of a Monty Python sketch. Yeah, they're going to say you're 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 overdoing it a little. I, I don't think they're, they're going to say you, you, for real, like you're doing what now? No, we, yeah. we wouldn't. If we made a joke about this, nobody would believe it. It's, it's <laughs> they would say we're, we're going overboard. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, again, but this I think this just points to what we what we've been talking about all along that. Um, you know, the government is pointing at, frankly, basically non-issues to distract from what's really happening in Macedonia, and especially now with the Presque Agreement as Parliament continues to debate the whole 19-page uh, agreement, which mm -hmm. if listeners haven't read that, I would urge them to read it once, read it twice, read it thrice, uh, because there's a lot of detail in there that talks about all of the obligations that Macedonia has towards Greece and what Macedonia has to do to change its its history, its culture, its heritage, everything. Yeah, the Vimera position at this point is even noting that, listen, we want to join the EU, and uh, the way the agreement is set up to open and close different chapters of the EU accession process, uh, it actually is going to create so many traps, booby traps along the way that even if we really wanted to, you know, earnestly wanted to join the European Union, and obviously, uh, on this podcast, the opinion is somewhat different than the one uh, shared by the Vimera party and the government. But mm -hmm. even if we earnestly wanted to join the EU, 
This is just going to create so many incentives for the government and, and the opposition parties in, in Greece and possibly Bulgaria to demand that the government blocks our accession, our uh, integration to the EU, unless we edit two more history books and we, you know, uh, penalize some principle in some school which was not fast enough in removing all the maps which Greeks might find offensive. So it's really going to be an endless uh, line of new arguments which would really grind down whatever EU integration progress we achieve to a halt. Up a very good point, and it's and it's not just uh, with issues pertaining to to school, school books, history books, etc. You know, there's entire articles. I don't have the 19-page agreement in front of me, but there's entire sections of the Presp Agreement that then demand that you know monuments change mm -hmm. and the star of Vergina, wherever it may be, mm -hmm. throughout the entire territory, be removed. And it's just an endless series of activities that the Macedonians must undertake to appease the Greeks mm. that if they miss one then the Greeks will simply say look you you didn't do this is the way we demanded therefore we're we're not going to uh, you know continue negotiating with you on you know article whatever of the EU accession treaty yeah and the funny thing is you know there is some metal company here which I guess does lids for the sewage you know when you cover up the yeah. sewage holes the manhole oh, yes and the act I don't know how this happened, but the guys thought it's a good idea to use the uh, flag of Kutlash Vergina, you know, the 16th yeah. star flag, uh, the, the 16th star sun uh, symbol on their manhole covers. So basically, uh, we will have diplomats from the Greek embassy literally going down sewage pipes and examining whether we're using this symbol on, on the sewage uh, lids. I mean, uh, and... Oh. It's very likely that in Brussels there's going to be a debate and pictures being shown there that, listen, they're, they're still using this manhole cover. Obviously, we cannot have them open up the next chapter on sanitation and uh, rural municipal uh, development if they're still using uh, th this symbol in, in, on their sewage. It's actually funny that you mentioned the manhole covers because when I was there in September, I, I took a picture of one with that very thought in mind. And I think we might even have a, a title for uh, this first podcast, uh, Sewage Manhole Covers of Macedonia. <laughs> uh, it's, I mean, it's going to happen. It sounds ridiculous, but it's really, really going to happen. <laughs> yeah, but you're right. They're all over Macedonia, of course. And they deserve it. Honestly, I, I can't say Same? I'm feeling bad for them. I, I actually uh, can't wait to have Nikola Dimitrov and whoever is Greek foreign minister in due time debating sewage pipes and uh, you know uh, idiot things like that because they, they actually deserve it I mean they, they fought for this real hard and now they got it they have a an agreement detailing all the minute issues which are going to be examined in Macedonia which Greeks find offensive and yes absolutely focus on this do this for the rest of your lives it's literally what you what you people deserve you, you bring up a good point about whoever Nikola Dimitrov is going to, his counterpart is going to be. Uh, of course, we have elections in Greece, probably in May, maybe before that, according to what I'm reading in uh, New Democracy, mm -hmm. the conservative part of the opposition, they have Demokratia, is far ahead of Syriza in the polls right now. And and once they get in power, of course, you know, everything's going to change. And it's kind of, it's, it's kind of hard to guess what's going to happen exactly regarding the Presp Agreement, if it had been ratified by then, how that affects the EU accession, etc. Yeah, I mean, the way I think what they're figuring out now, what they're going to try to do is uh, do this this uh, most urgent uh, thing on our agenda, which is bring Macedonia into NATO by hook or crook. And then I assume that the whole thing is going to un unravel afterwards, because uh, possibly Tsipras will be able to push through some kind of... Uh, ratification not only of the Prespa Treaty in the Greek Parliament, they actually have to ratify the more important thing, which is the Macedonian NATO accession instrument in the Greek Parliament. Because if they don't, if this doesn't happen, if they only ratify the treaty, but not the, the point where Greece uh, gives up on its right to veto our NATO membership again, as it did in 2008, then we get nothing and then nothing gets done. So I assume that, you know, the proponents of this deal envision a situation where Macedonia votes on the constitutional amendments by the end of the year and then the Greek ruling coalition would say that they want, wanted to 
discuss the issue again in March, but their own announcements said that they're going to ratify the treaty and the NATO accession protocol even before March. So somehow Cyprus is going to have to come up with 51% uh, of the vote in parliament uh, to support not only the, the ratification, but also NATO membership. And I imagine that the whole thing unravels afterwards as soon as, you know, Greeks hold elections and uh, a new democracy takes over. Uh, again, a side note, uh, we are amending our constitution, even though Macedonians actually refuse to get out and vote on a referendum specifically asking us, do we want to join NATO, EU, as the Republic of North Macedonia? So we actually rejected this offer. We were given right. the choice and we voted. Only 36% of the people voted. Out of them, uh, you know, there was this weird late half hour turnout in, in the last half hour turnout in Albanian districts, which until then voted about 30%, all of the sudden turnouts jumped to 70, 90% in some places. So even this, these 36% are very uh, uh, questionable. But in short, yeah, we had a referendum on EU and NATO and we said, no, thanks, we're good. I mean, not right now. It's, right. Not, it's not you, it's me. This was our answer. And even though this was the answer from the Macedonian people, we're still being pressured to ratify the agreement and change the constitution and change the name of the country. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, you, and again, you bring up a good point. It's all, I think it's always worth reminding folks that the referendum, frankly, failed, uh, and yet uh, the government of Macedonia, uh, the U.S. Embassy, State Department, OSCE, all of the other embassies, etc., uh, are, are saying that it, it was success, a success and it passed. And well, we have a word for this. It's called spin, mm. uh, and uh, and that's exactly what what these folks are trying to do. The majority of people, and it's it's kind of funny. It's not funny. It's it's this is the truth. Is the majority of people in Macedonia do want to join NATO in the EU, but not at any price. Yeah. And I think that's what pointing out. Not at the price of their dignity, their identity, their name, changes to their constitution being forced on them by another country, the changes we've been talking about to history books, school books, textbooks, the monuments and everything else, is where's the where's the dignity in being able to enter institutions that you feel affinity for if you are ground into the literally you are you're you are ground into the ground by your neighbors demanding that you make all of these changes. There's, 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 that's just wrong. We have a few choice words for this situation as well here, but I wouldn't repeat them in a family fr <laughs> friendly podcast. But you know, the, what, what is most likely to happen is that we have rejected this agreement. It's being uh, implemented by a number of, uh, by eight members of parliament who made up the difference which Zayev lacked to, to amend the constitution. Uh, as on the uh, after were, after they were charged with different crimes, you know, they themselves or their family members. So, you know, Vemero says that they're clearly being blackmailed, and you know, this is the impression which everybody in the in the country has. It's not going to be signed by the president. That's certain. Um, it's most likely not going to produce a, a United Nations Security Council resolution because. Russia, obviously, and rightfully at this point, I mean, I have to say, um, jumped in and said, well, listen, uh, this issue is opened by two Security Council resolutions. Uh, and yet we have a situation where this country voted, the public voted against uh, an outcome. So obviously they want to be the spoiler in this situation, but they have a very strong argument, very strong case, because the PRESPA agreement was rejected at the referendum. So it's not going to be solidified, set in stone, this renaming, because there's not going to be a Security Council resolution in all likelihood. We would have a uh, soon-to-be government in Greece, which re rejects the treaty. Uh, eventually, possibly sooner rather than later, we're going to have a government in Macedonia, which also rejects this treaty. So there are many, many uh, things that can go uh, south in this case, or down the manhole, and um, you know what we might get out of this. Uh, it would be a gain for Macedonia vis-a-vis -vis Greece if we are able to join NATO, which is a, a non-reversible decision. If Greeks mm -hmm. rat ratify our NATO membership, 
they write the file, we join, and that's it. I mean, I cannot mm -hmm. foresee a situation where we join NATO conditionally under a condition that we right. never, no. never uh, again uh, reverse this decision, uh, which is which we're being forced to do right now. So it would be in this tug of war between us, it would actually be a win for us if we join NATO while uh, making a, a seri very serious concession in amending our constitution, but it's still reversible, and especially given the way it's, it's being come to, we are uh, arriving uh, at this decision. So, uh, right. yeah, this is another issue which, is, which we're going to argue in the future over, not only the history books, but the legitimacy of the ratification process in Macedonia. The Constitutional Court will probably at some point have to decide on whether the referendum uh, we, you know, we have a very strong constitutional order that once the referendum passes, the parliament has to uh, adopt the decision of the referendum into law or constitution or whatever. And, uh, right. you know, so everything we do now could be reversed by a future parliament, by the constitutional court. A future government could simply uh, refuse to implement this, this deal and they will be very, you know, firmly grounded. Uh, there is not probably not going to be a uh, UN Security Council re resolution, which is seen as the founding, uh, foundational stone of this, uh, uh, of this uh, agreement. So yeah, there is a lot of things that we're going to argue about in the future with the Greeks. Yes, absolutely. And you, you, you know, I, I want to emphasize a point that you just made a moment ago about uh, the eight formerly Lumero members uh, that voted for it. Uh, you know, frankly, they were just doing, and Zion was just doing what Johannes Hahn, the EU Commissioner for Enlargement, basically told him to do, which was to uh, solve this, in other words, get that two-thirds in a, quote, Balkan way, unquote, mm. or Balkan manner. And so, um, you know, uh, I think Johannes Hahn should be proud of Zoran Zayev for using, quote, Balkan tactics uh, in achieving uh, what he was. But, of course, if, if Johannes Hahn is asking him to use Balkan tactics in that, Balkan tactics can be used in a different way as well that Johannes Hahn doesn't necessarily like. Oh no, it's it's, been, it's going great. I mean, obviously, uh, spoiler spoiler alert on this podcast: we are not great fans of the European Union, uh, and uh, <laughs> we are literally today discussing a situation where Germany is uh, apparently, you know, uh, what Angela Merkel failed to do when she came to Skopje to try to force us to. Uh, vote in the referendum. She was very uh, domineering. She was very in your face, but she never mentioned uh, uh, any financial aid. She didn't mention any money. This was a huge right. mistake on her part. Yes. So now Zayev is trying to, uh, you know, media close to Zayev, they're uh, coming up with stories that, well, uh, Germany is announcing sending some kind of experts to run the government essentially, and uh, German banks are going to give a lot of money for infrastructure, etc. And uh, uh, the European Union is also doing something similar. But listen, if you have already given the green light to use Balkan tactics in securing uh, 80 votes in Parliament, well, you know, you should be prepared that these Balkan tactics are going to be used when we have to spend the money you give us or when we have to pay them back as well. <laughs> Can you imagine the corruption that's going to take place when you have a prime minister who was twice charged, once pardoned, for you know this very low level of municipal crime and corruption, which happens in a in a city with which with public works, construction, and stuff like that. When you give him money for highways and railways, can you imagine what's going to happen with these money, which Germany and the European Union say they will give? We still haven't seen any of it. It's going to be incredible. Yeah, good point. And, uh, and speaking well, of the eight members of parliament, we haven't mentioned Grevsky actually a lot here in this podcast, but uh, in his uh, large, long-form uh, Facebook comment from Budapest, he actually mentioned some very interesting positions, which uh, you know, sh sh shed some light on the position of these eight members of parliament. He says, I was approached at one point by Zaev's brother, the infamous Vitsa Zaev, uh, and he says, I was offered that... Uh, uh, leniency in this uh, in these five six who is counting at this point criminal cases against me if I vote in favor. Now, mm. obviously, Grevsky did not take this offer because he voted against. He didn't encourage any of the his supporters to vote in the referendum to help Zayev make up the lack in uh, 
turn out. Uh, and none of these things happened, and obviously he eventually had to flee the country and seek asylum in Hungary. But these members of parliament who voted, three of them were literally driven to parliament from house arrest, from detention. And the wow. judge, the judge uh, allowed them to be released from house detention in uh, the cases of two of them the day before the vote. And obviously, one of the members of parliament was uh, holding out. And in his case, he was released by the judge nearly hours before the vote. So this was mm. complete overt uh, Balkan style, as Johannes Hahn would say, coordination between the government and uh, the judiciary. That the moment that these members of parliament, you know, it was estimated that they broke and they relented to the pressure they were exposed to, then they were released and said, okay, you can, you're now free to go wherever you want to, provided that first to go to the parliament and vote. And, you know, the, the amount of perversion of uh, rule of law and anti-corruption rules and democracy and parliamentary rules, which we will be bringing to the European Union if we ever join, and which we got yeah. the European Union to endorse in our case, you know, it's actually... I'm actually glad that this is the way this is shaping up because uh, right now in the minds of Macedonians, the um, tactics and the approach of the European Union is about as dirty as those manhole covers which we discussed. There's all these stories about, you know, guys over in Macedonia who are running these fake news sites. My second reaction, Tucker, was to say, if I ever run for president, I want these same Macedonian campaign consultants <laughs> who are the geniuses. Uh, that's, who, that's who the Russians go to when they want to really sew up a presidential campaign. <laughs> Welcome back to the Macedonian Content Farmers Podcast. I'm Jason Miko. Um, Svetin, uh, I, I kind of want to end this uh, first podcast. And, you know, as Jonah Goldberg uh, likes to say on his podcast, The Remnant, he, he likes to keep it kind of kind of weird, and I think we've done that. Um, but I want to end with uh, kind of some something uh, to take away for uh, the listeners can take away. And, and I want to leave two things out there. One is a, a current book I'm reading. Uh, I tend to read about 10 to 15 actual books a year. I don't do Kindle, I uh, don't do e-readers, things like that. I actually read physical books. Yep. Uh, and, and this one is actually mentioned by um, John in one of his podcasts. Uh, it's by Joshua Mravchik, and it's Heaven on Earth, The Rise and Fall of Socialism. Um, it's excellent. It's an actual history of socialism. And he tra I've just started uh, maybe 60 pages into it. And he traces it back to, not surprisingly, the, the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, and he takes it from there. And the actual word socialism was coined by uh, the followers of a Scottish industrialist in the early 1820s, uh, Robert Owen, uh -huh. uh, who believed in, he was trying to create utopia, which of course never works. Um, but anyway, it's, it's uh, the heaven on earth, the rise and fall of socialism. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, highly recommend it. And the second thing that I wanted to leave was, um, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts, as do you. Um, one of the ones, one of my favorite ones is Russ Roberts, who yeah, is an economist. He's great. He's excellent. Yeah, he's fantastic. And uh, he's got a podcast called Econ Talk. Uh, it's going to be found at econtalk.org, econtalk.org. And uh, the one I listened to the other night, um, he had, I believe the author's name is A.J. Jacobs, who is an author. And the book is called Thanks a Thousand, uh, which is kind of funny because the, the, it's a play on the phrase, thanks a million. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in Thanks a Thousand, um, A.J. Jacobs goes around and he literally tries to thank everybody who is involved in creating his morning cup of coffee. He gets a morning cup of coffee from the, the local, uh, local coffee shop down the street from where he lives. Excellent. And, and yeah, and he actually thought about it, uh, you know, from starting with the barista who, who makes his coffee. This is something I've really been thinking about and reading about and writing about the past year is the importance of gratitude and how gratitude really is the proper attitude in life and the proper way to go through life. You don't find happiness. Uh, you find happiness from being grateful. Uh, and, and I think that's that's the lesson of his, his book. And it's, it's, it's an hour podcast. It's fantastic. Highly recommend it. 
ecomtalk.org. The book is Thanks a Thousand. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I can imagine how many people go, to, go into just uh, providing the transportation for that cup of coffee from the uh, coffee growing belt to the to wherever Roberts works <laughs> and operates from. Okay. It's magnificent. I don't know, I haven't been doing many. Uh, I gave uh, one uh, thing which seemed it would look uplifting a try. It was the this uh, series on... Uh, uh, the Good Place, uh, it came highly recommended on a bunch of you know, shows and podcasts and wherever, uh, about the afterlife yep. in which you um, provided that you're good enough in your earthly life, you, you end up in this uh, uh, style, style of American suburbia, this uh, uh, beautiful corner in some uh, suburban sprawl district and... Uh, uh, you live out your eternity there, but and then very quickly it turns dark when you realize that it's actually not the good place, it's the bad place, and you're being tortured with uh, very inept torturers who cannot really uh, organize themselves around um, how to uh, approach uh, humanity and how best to use humanity to to torture uh, ourselves. And, uh, and you know, this is... Uh, you know, appropriately Kafkian style of uh, of a show for for the, uh, the times we live in because you try to give it take a break with some nice little Netflix comedy show, and yet they circle around and come to the to the fact that our humanity uh, is still stuck in the same old uh, corridors, wandering around and uh, trying to hurt and hit and torture each other and. Uh, um, even though we we are within grasp, we could we could be living this beautiful right. uh, suburban lifestyle, and yet we somehow cannot get ourselves to to do it. Wow! Fascinating. Wow. Well, uh, I think this is about as long as we could uh, annoy our listeners with. <laughs> news from Macedonia, and uh, but it's actually it's it's actually very it's happen it's a happening place. I think we'll have, you know, I, I don't think we could easily be turning two or three of these a week and still cover new ground in each of them. Oh sure, yeah, no, uh, you know, uh, Jonah uh, at the Remnant is talking about trying to reinstate his twice a week podcast. So editors do it once a week, and there's just so much news going on, which is both, uh, you know, I guess that's. I don't know if that's good or bad, to be honest with you, but oh, to cool. those of us that are news junkies, uh, you know, and those that follow it, uh, you know, it's, it certainly is, is uh, plenty of um, material to talk about. I think I overdosed uh, on the news in, in the second year of this political crisis, so I'm now <laughs> way beyond, I'm in the good place now. <laughs> okay, so, all right, uh, good. Well, all right. Fine. thank you for, for keeping up with us and for going to this first uh, of its kind uh, English language news podcast on Macedonian affairs and, and Macedonian content farming. Absolutely, yeah, possible. great. Well, well, Sven, I, it's been it's been great talking to you uh, from eight hours behind, and uh, look forward to catching up on the next one. Absolutely. Take care, buddy. Thanks. You too. Mark Stone, you are single-handedly making me pro-immigration, at least in your case. Thank you for joining More us tonight. More Macedonian immigrants, Tucker. That's what we need. They're already here. Oh! Thanks, Mark. Yes.